everybody, welcome to part two of the This Is My Bourbon podcast, Bourbon and Beyond recap. I am your host, Perry. Thank you all so much for tuning in to part two on this, uh, what I'm assuming is a wonderful Friday. Uh, I'm d- coming to you from the past. But <laughs> hope you enjoyed part one uh, as much as I did. Uh, like I said at the end of part one, I wanted to break it up for you because uh, if I hadn't, it would have been like a three hour long episode. Uh, and that is just way too much. Uh, so you got part one on Wednesday. And now that it's Friday, you've got part two. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time on it. So we are going to jump right into part two of the Bourbon and Beyond recap episode. Enjoy. Enjoy. One of the highlights for me so far this weekend, and I say this weekend, I've really only been here two days, uh, but it's been getting to meet a lot of the folks who have been on Top Chef. And we got Sarah Bradley now, who was on Top Chef. Yeah, last season. Yeah. Uh, first off, welcome to the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Happy to, happy to have you on. What was it like coming through and doing this whole culinary experience in Kentucky? Well, you know, I'm from Kentucky, and I was the... Are you really? Yeah, I'm, so oh. I'm from Paducah. I was the only show, uh, the only contestant this season uh, from Kentucky that was on the show. So it was pretty cool. I mean, it was it was a little pressure because you want to represent sure. and showcase well, but, um, yeah. but it was a lot of fun. That's good. Too. <laughs> yeah. was, was there any kind of, like, personal experience being from Kentucky that allowed you, that maybe gave you... I wouldn't say like a leg up necessarily, but did, did it give you a bit of an advantage in certain areas? Oh, I think so. Like yeah. uh, there was a joke the other people on the show would say, is she a witch or is she a wizard? Because we'd be driving somewhere and I'd say, oh, we're, we're definitely going to Keeneland. We're definitely going to, you know, Lake Cumberland. Like, oh, yeah. Like I knew sure. immediately when we left Lake Cumberland and we started out on the interstate, I said, we guys, we're going to Nashville. Like we knew. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, so it was definitely an advantage. You, you knew, yeah for, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's really cool, though. So um, I, I apologize. I haven't watched the that's season right. just yet. How did you fare? I did well. Uh, I got second. I was a runner-up. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, you did have a little bit of a, <laughs> yeah. a home, and, home state advantage. And, you know, I came in uh, a friend of mine. We've been friends for well over a decade. We worked together in New York City. She won. So it was pretty awesome. You know, if you're not going to win, at least you want your friend to win, not your enemy. That's a so, good point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, talk, too, about uh, your, your cooking style as well. How did you kind of develop um, your, your own style? Uh, where, where are some of those roots for um, you? Yeah, so I, I have a pretty interesting background. Um, Jewish mother, father's from the Appalachia region. So, um, you know, ate up, grew up eating all kinds of different foods. Sure. Um, lucky to get to travel some as a child and so I really enjoy taking these like very traditional regional recipes around Kentucky and Mm -hmm. adding little twists to them whether you make them you know the Appalachia a little more elevated or you take Jewish food and make it with southern you know twitches (laughs) and all that good stuff so that's really cool I, I, I love hearing the you know quite literally that melting pot uh of styles Kind of coming together and being married to, to something specific because I mean cooking should be something that you put your own spin on. Yeah. Right. I mean I I feel like it it is a passion that so many people have and when they have that really strong passion for it I mean it turns into something amazing. That's what makes Kentucky pretty cool and pretty pretty special in the culinary world. I mean we're not the Midwest. We're not yeah. you know the South. We're not the Rust Belt. We're not coastal we're close to everything you know yeah. we have tons of um you know waterfront property here <laughs> actually more than florida in kentucky do we really yeah i think all the rivers and the lakes i'm learning so lots. much today but that's what makes it really cool is we can pull from everywhere and still you know have this unique identity and i think that yeah K- kentucky is just kind of bred for that yep. you know i mean being in the middle of, of, of everything but I do have to ask you because it is, this is my bourbon podcast. Do you in any way kind of incorporate bourbon into your uh, into your cooking? Everywhere. Good. I mean, it goes savory. <laughs> it goes sweet. It goes, um, you know, our bourbon our bourbon menus pretty large. Um, over well over five hundred bourbons, whiskeys, and oh, rides fantastic. on the menu at the restaurant Freight House in Paducah. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we have quite a bit of bourbon, and I really like to drink <laughs> bourbon too. I actually like a really high proof rye. Like oh, if that's what I'm big fan. That's what I want. Big big fan. I'll tell you yeah. the, the the rye that I've been enjoying the most uh, recently has been the new riff rye. Oh yeah, it's that good. Hundred percent rye. I mean, good good stuff. Yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. new riff really. I think. Like with the new branding they came out with, and you know, switching it over from kind of that okay, I, I yeah. really think it's it's really improved. Yeah. It's tasting, drinking really well right now. So let, let's talk too a little bit about the restaurant. Um, obviously, you said you're from Paducah, from Paducah rather. Yeah. Um, what what was it that made you want to come back home and, and open your own restaurant there? I mean, it's not necessarily the most ideal location, I would say, in Kentucky for you know. A, a, a high pro, higher profile yeah. restaurant. Um, but. Well, you know, I traveled all over the South after I got done with college cooking, and then I was in New York City for like five years, and I was in Chicago, and then I moved to Chicago and I was there for three years or so. And then I would come home to Paducah, and there is just this like energy that's happening there. Good. It's like a town that's bursting at the seams. Like it wants to be a big city, but that's awesome. we just don't have that many people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, Yes, I thought I'm going to come home and open a restaurant, and there wasn't anything else like what we're doing around there, so didn't feel like I'd have a lot of direct competition. Sure. It's it's done really well. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So the name of it again is? Freight House. Freight House. Awesome. So everybody go check out Chef Sarah Bradley's restaurant in Paducah. Yeah. Freight House. Come thirsty, come hungry. Yes, absolutely. I will do both of those things. (laughs) Thank you so much, Sarah. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Okay, hi, I'm right. Perry, and this, this is my <laughs> bourbon podcast. I'm joined now with uh, Fred Minnick and Paul Blackburn, though. also Huncho. Is this, is this your imitation of me? Mm, no. <laughs> so tell me, Fred. <laughs> I have a much sexier voice than I how thought do I you, did. How do you feel today? <laughs> sexy. How do you feel today, did Fred? Did you hit puberty like last you... night? Or I... <laughs> in all, it, it, if I'm being candid in a, in a real moment... Uh, I, this has one, been one of the greatest uh, weekends of my career. I'm so happy to hear that. Last year, it was depressing. Mm-hmm. We got rained out. We got, you know, I remember going there the next day. We were walking on the site. Danny Wimmer's there in the middle of, of a flood pit. And he's yep. got a shovel trying to direct water. It was crazy. Yep. And, and it was like, and I pick up this... Uh, I, there's this random sign, and I'm thinking that I could use this to help channel water. And I pick it up, and I'm that I, is depressing. And I, and I like start trying to channel water, and Wimmer just comes over. He's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" I was there. That's a true story. Yeah. And anything to salvage the site. You know, and I was just, I just, I mean, my heart just was like in the mud, and it's like, you know, Wimmer's was, he was, he's business about it. You know, so yeah. he's he's his whole his whole mentality was the minute we were rained out, he was like, Fred, we're gonna come back bigger and stronger and better. And he's like, and anybody who does who doubts us, we'll leave them in the dust. You know, so like yeah. when you have that that kind of I feel like you can feel that confidence out there in the festival. Because we've been working on this for a year. Yeah. You know, and I love everything. I think that you know, it, you all announced before it even happened, uh, before the, before the rain out, that it was going to be a three day festival this year. And it, in a way, it kind of felt like you were setting yourself up for success before the failure had even <laughs> had even hit. Well, everything looks good on a sunshiny day. It does, <laughs> you know. So, um, music festivals are. You just really, you're really looking at, you're dependent upon the weather. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, but, and nobody wants to go to an indoor festival. They call that the state fair. That's <laughs> and there's, <laughs> it's called Comic Con. And there's like uh, <laughs> random people who haven't put on deodorant in five weeks trying to sell you corn on the cob or uh, some kind of broom <laughs> to use on your pool. <laughs> You know, I ah, mean, the old broom pool, the pool broom. <laughs> There's just nothing sexy about an indoor festival <laughs> or a pool broom, <laughs> except maybe, maybe the bathrooms, toilets. But then again, I don't know what's worse, 
a really active state fair toilet or a porta potty? <laughs> I think an active state fair toilet. <laughs> I think so you're too. right. They service the porta pots out here pretty frequently. They do. Yeah, we do. I've seen it. I smelt it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you tell me yesterday when you, when, you, when you were over by one? Well, they were cleaning them out back here like 4.30 yesterday or the day before. And I walked out from the stage and I thought the black plague hit me because it, it smelled like death. It was overwhelming. I almost I gagged a little. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Paul's got this really great, great restaurant called Kuvion. Yeah, we were, and we they've were, got we all went they've there got, together last um, year. They've got a uh, a stand here, and they sold really? out yesterday. Two days in a row. Did you really? Yeah, and we like quadrupled what we brought back uh, yesterday. So, dude, ima- that's awesome. Cajun brown. You'll bag. sell out again. I hope so. Imagine that. That's you incredible. Know. That's the thing is too is like this this festival. I mean, it's bringing economic um, joy to everybody who Absolutely. participates. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, hot- the hotels around here never get anything like this. I mean, people are always like, again, I go back to the state fair, you know, that's. <laughs> that's the FAFA in them, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a different crowd. Uh, you They're know, not you get, staying at the Crown Plaza. No. I mean, the Crown Plaza has actually been really nice. I really, I really do like those yeah. guys. It's cool over there. Also, just real quick, yeah. to talk about Kuvion. Yeah. Which is absolutely 100% my favorite restaurant in Louisville. I love it when you come. Um, I love being there. Yeah. Uh, you, you guys were kind enough to host our uh, first podcast meetup uh, back in April. Yes. Which was very, very kind of you all. And um, we had great food, great service. Thank you. As always. I had to because they're now ingrained somewhere deep, deep, deep. Inside of my my body, <laughs> what's it's ingrained the, deep inside your body? It's the, the the Cheeto dust. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, pork rinds. Pork rinds. Thank oh, you. I almost said pork cracklins. I was like, that's not right. Cracklin. You're thinking you're you're, you're combining a crackling. Yeah, it's crackling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, fair enough. But yeah, so you've been all right. Jackie Zykan's walking over and shaking her Ladies head. Ladies and out. gentlemen, oh, Jackie, Jackie Zykan. I just want to say hi. Oh, okay. Oh. Hi, Jackie. Hello. Jackie Zykin is leaving us, ladies and okay, gentlemen. Bye, bye, She's Jackie. going to go eat. She puts her sunglasses on. Her, her brim lipstick's of her beautiful hat. today. Oh, she's flipping she, us off. I'm just oh. kidding. She waves, <laughs> she waves as the cold glass glistens in her hand. Sweet tea. Sweet tea. She's drinking sweet tea with a shot of? Ooh. <laughs> ice. With a shot of ice. A shot of ice. Wow. That felt good. <laughs> Bye bye, Jackie oh, Zykin. All right, see see you later, Jackie. Okay. She'll be back. <laughs> hey, we have to talk about too what happened yesterday on your uh, your panel with the Van Winkles. Yeah, that there was, was some big big news that dropped. Yeah, it was pretty explosive. Yeah. Uh, the, so uh, I I'm assuming that wasn't planned. No, hell no, I didn't plan that. <laughs> you know, I don't give people. Uh, I actually don't give people prep for for panels. People will always ask me for questions. Um. And um, I never do because we operate very similarly. <laughs> similarly, uh, that's why I said I've always liked you, liked your interview style. Well, but I was a little disappointed last week when you asked me who Raylan Nelson was, and you didn't know that was Willie yeah, really Nelson's granddaughter. That was, that was a, a dark you, moment for me. And you were like, "Oh, I didn't know that's going to change everything." And it did. And I mean, you should at least Google a guest before right. they get on. You're right. I'm, I'm <laughs> look. <laughs> I mean, Google. If, if he called, us all smart. So, so he called. Fred called me out on Friday in front of everybody. I never do that, but yes, I did. You, you, he did it <laughs> for not doing research. I totally. I was like, it. oh, great, great. This but is you, definitely a black eye on my reputation. But, <laughs> but it's only because I love you. I know, and I, I do actually too. like your work. Well, thank you. I, I, well, I wouldn't that, keep coming on. Well. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the Van Winkles uh, uh, dropped the news that uh, they hired lawyers. Yeah, they actually worked with Facebook to shut uh, shut down the secondary market. Now, something that's always been rumored, you know, people always thought thought that. And when you listen to their side of it, and we we recorded that for uh, Bourbon Pursuit. Yes. Yeah. So you'll get to hear all that if you want to go listen Mm -hmm. to it. But when you listen to their side of it, there's a lot of anger there from them. They really, really feel like they've been damaged by... Um, the secondary market, and whether you believe, whether you agree with that or not, whether you, uh, you know, think it's it's their prerogative, 
They own the brand. Well, sure. They, another thing that came out, I did not know they owned as much as they did. They own 54% of their company. Wow. Yeah, that that was the big thing for me. Like the secondary wow. market thing is kind of like it's juicy scoop news. Sure. But, but uh, I did not know that uh, the Van Winkle still owned the uh, majority. And actually, 54% as a businessman, that's a pretty good majority. That's that's controlling interest. That's controlling yeah. interest. They can do whatever they want with that brand. Exactly. I had I had no idea that they even considered themselves that involved with the brand still. But that that's well, pretty incredible. I think what they have done is they have insulated themselves, you know, and they, you know, Julian, Julian, they, they, people who don't, people in our world just throw tomatoes and throw rocks yeah. at that family, and they don't understand what that family did to build it to get to where it is now. Yeah, absolutely. And they also don't get the fact that, you know, I mean, they're not loaded, they're not rich. I mean, they're. I mean, yeah, they they do well, but they're not. Their wealth is. Uh, if you take a look at the sales of what they would technically get on the retail right. side, I mean, they're they're small in comparison yeah. to like a Heaven Hill. I mean, or or even but their sister brands at Buffalo Trace. I mean, they're tiny. That's that's such an interesting thought to to kind of dive into because I mean. Pappy is the, it is the premium brand. Definitely. You know, I, I, I mean, it, it, you would think that they <laughs> would have a little bit more money behind. But you know what? I, I think to your his point is that people that are paying $1,000, $1,500 a bottle, they're not get that. They're not getting that money. They're the retail. What's the retail? Oh, no, what's no. retail? Regular retail. Somebody wasn't going to mark it up. On twenty three, I think it's like two fifty. Right, but I think you know? people in their minds think, man, that stuff's going for fifteen hundred dollars a That's, bottle. Yeah. The Van Winkles are getting rich. Exactly. Yeah, but it, yeah, you're right. I mean, they're they're. Yeah, I, that I think that is a, a really specific dichotomy that you have to. Sorry about that. Or, I had to take a, a festival call. Oh no no no! It's okay. That's how this festival goes. I know. <laughs> I, have, I get like <laughs> you'll be on fo- stage. I'll be on stage, and I have to go do this and go do that. And yeah. No, no, no. It's all, it, it's all good. But we were just saying that people probably assume the Van Weekles have a lot of money because their bottle, the bottles go for so much in the secondary market. Yeah. When actual retail is much more reasonable. Yeah, and if you can get a bottle, and everyone everyone uh, blames them, and and then there's the. There's conspiracy theories around it, and there's uh, all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, I don't really have an opinion. I just ask questions and listen, um, and I see all sides on it. But uh, I, 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 I think it comes down to like, uh, you know, what do you want? What do you want them to do? You know, and I think I think hiring lawyers and going to the secondary market is is the farthest extreme I could possibly imagine. And if they feel like that's what they got to do to protect themselves, who am I to say that they shouldn't? I hey, their name's on the bottle, man. You got to protect your personal brand. I don't blame them for it. I really you don't. Know? I mean, I own businesses. Mm-hmm. You can go to war for them if you had to. Yeah, I mean, it's not a... Um, it's tough. It is. It's tough. And the thing is, is they get vilified. They get absolutely vilified. And, um, yeah... I mean, I also see. I also see another side. Like Julian donates a lot of, a lot of his bottles, his personal yes. bottles to charity. Yeah. And, uh, and they raise. I mean, just at the Speed Museum the other day. I mean, he raised, his bottles raised uh, over thirty grand. So that's incredible. You know, well, it really is, isn't it? No, it it, it absolutely is. And he didn't yeah. get a dime of that. All right, we'll we'll get off the, the pappy, <laughs> train there for for now. I, I am happy to hear from you that you feel like this has been a huge success this weekend. Uh, yeah, it, and that panel is part of it. You know, yeah. I mean, the the creating the creating of these panels, the curation of them. It's my vision to have to not let it be marketing oriented, to not right. let it be brand driven. Mm-hmm. I want people to step in there and learn something. Um, and if it's a juicy scoop, it's a juicy scoop. Yeah. If it's uh, learning uh, something else, I think next year I I need to uh, incorporate the artists. So I think next year you'll see like oh I think that'd be great. Oh next year like I'll have like a drummer of a band or maybe a uh, singer, 
uh, a really famous musician re- reached out to me in the last uh, in the last month or two, in the last couple of weeks, uh, wanting to do something with me on stage. So I think you'll uh, I think you'll find that next year we'll still have the geeky stuff. Yeah, but I'll be integrating some uh, artists. I think that's great. I, I'm I'm excited for where things even continue to grow into next year. But until then, I I, I cannot say enough about how wonderful these past two weekends have been. I'm glad to um, hear it. And I, I I applaud you. I applaud Danny Wimmer and and everybody that's been involved in making this such a fantastic experience absolutely a huge step up from last year awesome i, I mean th- this is very very incredible so i say cheers to you guys and cheers to that with a big old heap of glass of water listen <laughs> stay hydrated cheers yes. yes thank you guys hey this is a treat i th- th- this is something that i kind of uh, i didn't i didn't think that this was even a possibility it never really crossed my mind that we would we would be able to do this but i've got rob dietrich the master distiller for Black and Whiskey. Rob, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. I'm, this, I'm happy to be here. This is really, really a, a, a something special for me, and um, it, for, for a couple of reasons. First off, um, Dave Pickerel was a hero of mine. Still, Yeah, he's, he's, he's still, he, still a hero of mine still, as well. Absol- absolutely is. Um, and and to, to get to chat with you... Um, Basically, you, you filled those shoes when he passed away. You know, I, I, I wouldn't consider it filling those shoes. I, I don't think there's anybody who could fill uh, the, the legend of, of Dave that's, Pickerel. That's true. You that's know, true. I, um, I feel kind of humble. I feel not kind of. I feel very humble to be able to, uh, you know, to, to be his predecessor and to take over his project. Yeah. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I brought my own shoes, um, you know, to, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I really, like that. I like that a lot. And, and, and with that, you know, it just, it, to me, it's, a, it's important to, yeah. to continue to uphold and honor the legacy of Dave. Absolutely. And, and also to, uh, to bring what I bring to the table and, and, and make some, some incredible whiskey. Yeah, for sure. And uh, the, the other thing, too, um, my dad is a huge Metallica fan. And was just absolutely chomping at the bit to yeah. pick up a bottle of Blackened. Oh, nice! Uh, when, when when it was announced, and I was like, Dad, we'll definitely, we'll, you know, you'll get a bottle, we'll drink it on the show, and you know, all yeah. that. And so we've yet to actually do that, but we've we've got a couple bottles ready to be consumed for the show. So I, I know that he's going to get a kick out of knowing that uh, that you were on the show um, for sure. But let's talk about the whiskey. Yeah. Um, Blackened is really unique, um, right? It, it, it's not a bourbon; it's a whiskey. Correct. Right. You know, yeah. it's it's got some bourbon roots, um, you know, in in some respects. But uh, you know, I think just like with anything, um, when you're when you're being innovative, especially with whiskey, uh, you're 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 gonna you're gonna you're gonna push those limits and those boundaries, and that's what this whiskey does. You know, so we are a blend of five uh, five different bourbons and ryes. Wow. So we've got. You know, we got bourbon from uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and Indiana. We got rye from uh, Indiana and and, uh, and Canada. Um, average eight years, and uh, and then we cask finish it in in, yeah. uh, in Spanish brandy barrels. You know, and that's that's something uh, historically I've I've messed around with in in a past life when I was the master distiller for uh, uh, single malt uh, whiskey out in Colorado. Oh, wow. Um, that's what I was doing with some cask finishes out there that really um, hit the market, uh, uh, took the market by storm. So I, yeah. I was really excited to be a part of this project. And of course, um, you know, it, we, we're not just going to end it with, uh, you know, cask finishing. We're we're going to kick it up a notch and take it to 11 and go to uh, uh, doing some, uh, <laughs> you, uh, applying what we call black noise as our uh, sonic enhancement. Yeah, that that's something else that is really, really interesting about this process. There are people who, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I at times have been one of them, are critics of that, that process of pumping sound into a barrel. Oh, yeah. You I, know, because it, it and I, I think that's what happens with innovation, right? There are critics at, at, from the get-go, and then as, you know, it, it comes to the market, people start to kind of warm up to it and everything. And I'll be honest with you too, I have warmed up to this quite a bit. And the the idea of going, why why would they ever consider doing that? That's totally left my brain. 
Yeah. It's, I, I think that's it, you. You guys did something right, and in doing so, created a very good product. Uh, you know, I think it's it's always going to be natural to have skepticism over something that's new. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I I the way I look at it, it's like. You, you think about that that little town where uh, the the first horseless carriage comes, you know, clamoring <laughs> in, and and people are, are, are you know are, are running in fear, and they're and they're like, I would never step foot in that thing. I'm going to stick with my, my my mule. Thank right. you very much. And uh, and I think it, there's always a point where um, first there's uh, there's there's awe and wonder and skepticism, and then there you know there's skepticism first, and then I think then there's a little bit of awe. And wonder, and then there's acceptance. You know, there's, there's, that's when people accept, like, oh yeah, uh, of course, you know, of course, cars. Everybody's got a car in their garage. Everybody's got maybe two. Now it's just the norm. You know, now it's now Absolutely. we're taking cars to a whole nother level anyway. So I, I think the same way in the whiskey world, especially since it's it's so um, so steeped in, in tradition and in traditional methods. Um, you know, people are reluctant to, to let go of those traditional methods. And and the beauty of this whiskey is that we are. Um, deeply rooted in those traditional methods. We're just taking it up another level. We're trying something new and innovative because we can. You know, Definitely. This is, this is the modern era. Why not? Why not try something new? Well, it, it only makes sense, too, that it's being done with somebody like Metallica. I mean, how, how can you not want to incorporate sound, music, into the production of a whiskey? I mean, it just, it just seems to make sense in a, a weird cosmic sort of way that you know all of these things all the stars kind of align for this to happen and then when they do happen it works you know I, exactly it, they, yeah. they, it, it, it just if it honestly had gone any other way with metallica i would have been surprised <laughs> well, and, and that's I, I think this was really again you know going back to dave's uh dave's vision um, mm-hmm. You know, he really wanted to do something that that really brought the band a, in to be a part of the whiskey. You know, the the collaboration is real. You know, that's the that's the beauty of this is that you know this is not just a, um, some amazing bourbons For and sure. rise from some amazing distilleries, but this is also that blend and then the cask finishing. Then there's this amazing collaboration where you know we're we're using uh, you know uh, uh, proprietary equipment that mm-hmm. is has been developed and created with the Metallica guys with with yeah. Dave um, with their sound company and uh, and and applying this um, you know the black noise sonic enhancement uh, right pro- and, pass- and it does work i was that was my first question as a as a whiskey <laughs> nerd was like all right I'm like, okay, what's it do? What is this about? <laughs> I want to know. I want to just like everybody else. You know, I was skeptical too. I was like, hey, I want to sure. know. I want to know. Okay, is this a real deal? Yeah. Because I, you know, I, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a part of project unless it's real and it's, and it's got heart and it's, and right. it's truly something that's extraordinary and unique. And that's exactly what this whiskey is. And and, you know, I, I think that's the best way to go about it. Honestly, if if, if you're going in half-heartedly. No, you got to question everything. I mean, that's sure. you know, that's and I, and I think that's the way you know that's how, you know, that's how Dave, you know, even uh, kind of uh, yes e- evolved was that you know, um, he questioned like, can we do this? Yeah. And the answer is yes, we can do this. And, Absolutely. And, and, and the band was yes, we can do this. And this is where they <laughs> this is where they get to put their fingerprints on the process because it's it's their music that we are using to uh, right. you know to do that sonic enhancement with, with black noise and it and it's. Um, uh, and it's at such a low frequency that you know it's it's um, sure it does some some incredible movement. So, so let's talk too about uh, the the collaborative process um, between you and the band, because and and, and this is something that I wanted to uh, touch on. James is sober. Yes. Yeah. That's always. Uh, and so yeah. you know that that you know means that he's not trying the whiskey before it it, it goes to market. So. How did you guys kind of approach that? It, it, I mean, was he was he asking, "Is it good?" <laughs> you know, or, or was it you know was was he very kind of hands off with with some of it? No, you know, and uh, he's obviously going to be hands off in, in any of the kind of the the tasting aspect. You know, that's right. he's, he's he's trusting he's trusting the other people in the room. I just I think you know like just like any professional, you know, he's going to trust his his professional Absolutely. sound guy to to know what he's doing. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think with this, it's like okay, well, I'm going to trust the the professionals, the guys who mm-hmm. make this, uh, to know that they're making something real. The, the amazing thing about the way the band works and the way they run their business is that they work together as a band. They make decisions as a band. It's all 
voted. You know, they they that's make great. their decisions together. That's how they make music. Yeah. That's how you know. That's how they're adding and collaborating together. So. It's no different when they're making a decision to make a, a whiskey that they can find another way to connect with their fans. This is truly uh, another one of those ways um, that they felt was important, and they and they and they saw it. You know, they saw, hey, this is a you know, this is a brave new world. This is something yeah. that they, they get excited about the adventure of of, of this. And and yes, you know, um, some of the members of, of the band are sober, and, and some of the other members are, are are absolutely enjoying the whiskey and and. And I feel like there's a, an, an amazing balance yeah. between uh, the way we are, we are approaching this project. Yeah, and I, I, I think that that's, you know, it. I like that they kind of, you know, take their own approach to it. I think it makes oh, yeah. it, 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 it's the only way that it makes sense. Uh, let's talk about the, the whiskey, though. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we've kind of danced around talking about it uh, in, in, as it exists, as a product. Um, but so it, you said five blend or five different products yep. blended together, um, and then finished in, in brandy barrels. Correct. Yeah. This is produced. It's something that I would consider to be one of the most unique whiskeys on the market. I, I would as, agree. And, and, I, I, and I, unique can be interpreted as you know it, it it can be interpreted as a negative thing. I don't mean that at all. I mean unique is that it stands out. <laughs> right, and, and that's from everything in the pack. I, I I would agree with you as well. You know, it's it's something. Uh, you know, I cut my teeth in making an American single malt whiskey, mm-hmm. which was unusual in the U.S. People were like, "Well, you know, how much corn is in this?" And I was like, "Well, it's 100 percent barley." Like, yeah, but well, how much corn is that? And I was like, "Well, that- <laughs> do the math." <laughs> you know, so you know, and and so I'm used to kind of coming out of out of. Uh, you know, being that uh, that that scrappy kid coming out of the corner, like I'm, we're, we're forging our own path. And that's why I was so excited to be able to work on, uh, to be able to to be, um, be you know, become the master distiller for uh, this whiskey, and and, and and I'm the master blender for it. You know, that's yeah. what I'm doing for this project, and and it, it, I was so excited about um, this the 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 real science, the truth behind it, uh, that to me was extraordinary. The collaboration um, of, of music and whiskey. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, with, with uh, again, with those, those, um, uh, those five year, you know, five, five, I'm sorry, five different bourbons right. uh, and rise, you know, that the blend of those together just is unique in itself. Then we're gonna go that next level, cask finish. That's just taking it up an, another notch. Then, you, you know, the sunk enhancement, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll break that process down as much as I can for yes, you. Yes, please. It's, um, please. Because it is. It's really kind of. It's just mind bending, you know. So, uh, so the sound company that that builds the the you know even the proprietary equipment for Metallica, uh, which is very bass heavy. You know, that's a very bass heavy band. Right. They are. They are. Um, you know, we work together with them uh, and the bands and, uh, and and you know where we where where we store our barrels. We are. Uh, using this proprietary uh, system to be able to uh, literally, you know, we're, we're pummeling the whiskey with uh, right. with with a, a low frequency uh, sound. So yeah. this sound, there's there's some stuff on the internet. If you if you look up YouTube uh, and and uh, you know uh, sound and water, you know you can see uh, there's a guy who has a, a stream of water running in front of a speaker, and he and he turns up he turns the the, the frequency. Up and down, and you can see the water spiral in front of the in front of the speaker, and he can reverse the spiral. Right. It's amazing what you can do to control uh, liquid and control the elements uh, and the molecules in the water. That right there is just mind blowing in itself. When you when you add a barrel and you add liquid in a barrel, um, we add liquid in a barrel. You are uh, you're, that 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 whiskey is is moving in and out of the barrel. Right. You're, you're picking up all those elements uh, that are you know when you when you char the inside of a barrel, you get all those those natural sugars, the tannins, the vanillins, yeah. uh, that caramelized band of sugar. And when you uh, uh, you know when you when you start really just vibrating that whiskey back and forth, it's going past that red line. Absolutely. You know, we're going we're going past that. We're going into the the forbidden zone, man. We're going <laughs> we're taking it beyond, and we're gonna you know this is like Star Trek. How how does that affect uh, the the angel share aspect of the whiskey? I mean, are, are do you find that you're losing a lot more than you would have if you just let it sit in the barrel? You know, this is still um, you know it's a new process. We we are we're, you know every step of the way we're we're you know recording how uh, you know the effects that it, that this is happening at at you know at how many days, how many weeks, how many months that we're doing this uh, process, um, and we're also really looking at 
uh, you know that we're, we still haven't identified exactly the, the angel share on, on that. Right. And I, right. And I think um, you know I'm used to a, I'm from Denver where I you know I, I ran barrel houses out there for years and and, and it was we were always combating that that dry climate. You know it's a, it's not a humid climate. Um, I think you know where the barrels are are stored that we're getting them from is a much more humid climate. You know so that's uh, that's that's definitely. Um, all these beautiful elements that I'm, I'm still putting my, wrapping my mind around. Um, plus, we're, you know, we're adding this, this whole new innovative experience, you know, with black noise. Yeah. Um, right. We, we're, we're adding this, um, this crazy element. So it's, uh, it's still, uh, you know, the Wild West, man. We're, we're still, <laughs> we're pioneering right now. Rob, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking it's about my pleasure. black and this has been a real treat. And uh, it, you know. Let's try to do something more in the future. Absolutely. I, so, I, you know, if, if it involves drinking whiskey, I'm in. Oh, you know what we should do? We should do a single barrel of Blacken. You know, that we, would be something special. We've talked about that uh, because we are a blend. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, um, we'd have to take that blend and put it into a single barrel. Or, yeah, yeah, so, right. So we've right, talked right. about a single barrel program, but I think uh, you know, right now we're still um, really maintaining. Uh, just getting blackened uh, at, at your doorstep. You know, we want to make sure everybody's getting Absolutely. it out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we well, are in about 22 states right now. We're, we're, we're you know, we're. Yeah, we're, right, right. Uh, you know, whiskey's the long game, so trying to, you know, we don't, we don't, we, it's, it's, you don't crank it up. No. No, you do not. <laughs> you, uh, you let it, uh, you let it roll its, uh, its own path. For sure. Rob, thank you again so much. Absolutely my pleasure. An absolute honor. Thank you, man. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. So this is kind of fun. I'm, I'm excited to have Joanne Street. On the podcast, Joanne is a, a brand rep from Wild Turkey, and not just a brand rep, you're part of the Wild Turkey family. Sure am. Directly, yeah. So first off, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. It, of course. Nice to run into you here at uh, Bourbon and Beyond. Yeah, I, I walked past you and I was like, is that Joanne? <laughs> <laughs> What's she doing in Kentucky? And then I was like, oh. Eddie's here too. Strangely so. enough, I do live here, but <laughs> not here that often. I thought, yeah, I was gonna say I thought that you were kind of a, a, yeah. a world traveler at this point. Um, for the most part, on the East Coast right now, but I I am based in Louisville, so you can catch me there maybe okay. like a weekend or two out of the month. And and this is that weekend apparently. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. You guys got me in Louisville for like two weeks. We got behind the barrel about to start up this evening. Yeah, you do. Yeah, that's so. so exciting. Talk about that too. How did that kind of come to be? Yeah, so it started, I believe, about five maybe or six years ago and it's essentially a program that we put on at wild turkey where we invite bartenders trade from across the country to really come and immerse themselves into who we are as a brand at wild turkey they camp on site it's really probably the only time me jimmy eddie and bruce are all together besides thanksgiving or christmas <laughs> for the most part yeah. um, but they get to come in and really dive into what wild turkey is why we do things the way we are why jimmy is so stubborn in the way he makes things Things, you know and yeah, Jimmy's stubborn <laughs> we um, take them through the distillery the warehouse we have a really beautiful Thanksgiving dinner outside of a warehouse which I'm sure you guys are yes. familiar with yeah. mm -hmm. um, overlooking oh, the Kentucky Kentucky River but it's just a really nice time for for them to come in and they definitely don't get enough thank yous um, from everybody from time to time I always like to say everything starts from behind the bar and it's a really nice way for Absolutely. us to tell them hey thanks for what you do um, we notice it we care about it um, without you guys we wouldn't be able to do what we do for so. sure, for sure, yeah. I, I I'm really interested too in the way that you kind of became a part of the brand. Sure. Because it's it, yes, it's been a family thing for mm -hmm. 65 years now. Right. Yeah, as of the other day, which is amazing, by the way. But what led you to want to be a, a, a part of that brand, representative of that brand? I mean, was it the passion mm -hmm. that you saw from from your family or, you know? Yeah, so for me, I actually grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. So not far from Jack okay. Daniels, but Eddie always likes to joke about how I moved to Kentucky to get, a, get to the good stuff, <laughs> you know? Um, but for me, I actually transferred to the University of Kentucky as a junior. Right. Um, just about to turn 21 years old. Hey, I should probably get a summer job. And there are a few people at the distillery that really pushed me to and encouraged me, hey, this is a great place to work. You should just come and check it out. Um, you are part of the Russell family. Yeah. And so I went to work there one summer. 
um, took the year off and then came back the next summer and ended up working throughout the year. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. At first, I was like, I'm 21 years old and I work at a distillery. This is <laughs> awesome, yeah, right? Cool. Like, yeah. I bet all my college buddies think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> um, and then I'd say it was about a year and a half in, that second summer that I came back. Uh, or third summer, I guess, that I came back and I really realized the respect that people had when they spoke to Jimmy, um, the way that Eddie and Bruce talked about the brand, the way that they engaged with people. Um, and then you guys have been to the distillery before. When you oh, get yeah. there, it's, it's oh, this yeah. atmosphere. I mean, you can't really describe it when you're sitting in a warehouse with Eddie Russell that was built in 1894, yeah. or you walk into the visitor center and Jimmy Russell's just hanging out, signing bottles, and you it's don't the see that. It's, it, it's it the passion the and the love that they have for it. Um, it's just, it's a really cool thing to be a part of, and I'm I'm beyond lucky to be a part of it. Yeah, and, absolutely. And like the family aspect is so amazing, just even beyond the family. Like, yeah. so I took my uh, my mom for Mother's Day. And Jimmy was there, and she wasn't expecting that at all. And, you know, just the, having that experience, like, that made my mom's year. You know, it was just, and you can just feel the history and, and being in the warehouses and stuff like that. It's just amazing to me. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's the bourbon uh, culture in general, mm-hmm. though. It's like just oh, for sure. So much of the family aspect and the experience. Right. And, and you never you never know who you're going to run into. I love being here in Kentucky because it's not competitive here. I mean, Last night, we were at Bourbon Festival hanging out with Fred and Freddie, and Mm -hmm. Jimmy was sitting right there, and then Al from Four Roses came over, and Brett, and I was like, this is a whole lot of trouble about to happen. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But that's the best part of it, is is the stuff that you get to see, that family aspect, you know? We we all kind of take care of each other, and... Hopefully, I never go anywhere and stay at Wild Turkey, but maybe if something happens, I, I got another family I can oh, join. That's but not, I don't no, see that. I don't want to even yeah. think about that. I don't that see myself sad. going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's the best thing in the world when you get to go and you see Jimmy and Eddie and Bruce and myself hanging out, and then you look up and there's Fred and Freddie and, and a few other families that have just been in the industry for a very long time. It, it really is the best part about the job. Absolutely. Joanne, thank you so much for sitting down with us for a few Thanks. moments. We'll uh, we'll have to catch up another time. Absolutely. Thank too. you, guys. So, it was so nice running into great. you all. Appreciate yeah, it. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Curtis. What's up? I'm thick. I don't even know what to say at this point because we've had some really great guests on this weekend. But yeah, and they keep coming, too. They, That's they, just the great They part. really do just keep coming. But let me tell you something. Um, I didn't think that this guy was going to show up. No? I had no idea. Why is that? I feel like we should give him some, like, rebuttal time. Like, why no, didn't you no, think? No, 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 <laughs> I'm going to let him stay quiet until uh, yeah, I actually introduce him. Because it's, it's podcast etiquette. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Bruce Russell. Hey, what's up, Bruce? guys? Oh, my gosh, man. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be sitting down with you. Thanks. And uh, uh, all, all of the... So we had uh, Joanne on earlier nice. as well. Yeah. Um, and we were talking a little bit about the legacy that you know you kind of embody uh, with, with with the wild turkey brand right now. Um, first off, as I said, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate Second, that. Second, I, I have to ask you this, and we yeah. haven't actually done this uh, for this episode, but we usually ask uh, the people who, who come on uh, what they've been drinking recently. So, yeah. what have you been drinking recently? Uh, well, I got really lucky. Last um, last night, I got to check out a, a buddy of mine working at a, a little liquor store called Justin's House of Bourbon in Lexington. Mm. Got to hang out at that bar yeah, for a familiar, minute. And, uh, familiar with exactly them. where yeah, that's yeah. at. Yeah. And uh, my buddy Ryan has started to work there a little bit part-time on the weekends and stuff, working behind the bar and helping them sell some stuff. And uh, tried their new Willet Barrel uh, yesterday. I think it was a six-year-old bourbon. Yes. So good. Now, hot, like a lot of those Willet sure. Single Barrels are, sure. 129-ish proof maybe. Right. Um, so good. So, so, so good. I think they, I was in there yesterday. They had like five bottles left. Started off with the whole barrel, I think, okay. first thing in the morning. It, wow. it was that good. Yeah. Um, and then we tried a little bit of uh, 67 Old Crow. Uh, that was insane. I'm living yeah. the dream right there. Um, <laughs> tried some of my favorite product of all time because I just saw it back there. I was like, oh, I got to get some of that six year old Heaven Hill bottled and bond. Oh, mm-hmm. heck yes. Because uh, that's what I grew up drinking. Don't oh, tell, yeah. you know, Jimmy or oh, yeah, I, I know. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was just yeah, like Mimi's going to be listening to It was to just this. the best deal in the world. You know, you <laughs> oh, get a handle over for like 13 such a bucks. value for it, yeah. <laughs> uh, so drank some of that too. Our, uh, um, our buddy Swan nice. actually found a bottle the other day for $13. Yep. Even though yeah. it skyrocketed to like forty. Yeah. I like that though, the good old price. Oh yeah. No, yeah. It, it, twelve ninety nine couldn't yeah. beat it. <laughs> Let's talk about the wild turkey ride. Yeah. 
Let's do I, it. Because, I mean, that that's your speciality. Yeah. I am the point. Raga. Yeah, yeah, you are Bruce, uh, yeah, Russell's Raga. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Cornerstone Rhyme is the new Master's Key mm -hmm. release. Um, I, I, I've been saying this all weekend, and I, I, I want to kind of reiterate it. I'm nothing if not honest when people come on the show. I didn't like Cornerstone at first, but it really did start to grow on me. Nice. It, it, it took like a few sips for me to, you know, acclimate my, my palate to it and everything. But I will say, it is a really interesting one. Thank you. Um, how did that product kind of come to be? I mean, I, I, I know that you had a big hand in making that happen, but, you know, why was Rye the next step in the Master's Key? Uh, so, I guess I was like indirectly involved or indirectly responsible for the product. But it was when I first came on as a, a brand ambassador for the brand, um, which would have been five or six years ago. And they right. told me, like, oh, you can travel around, kind of learn the other side of the industry, move to Austin, Texas. Uh, I jumped on that chance. But right before they let me, you know, let me loose down there, um, I spent some time in the distillery kind of apprenticing under dad. And the very first thing that he always wanted to do was check out the warehouse, see what new barrels are, you know, hanging out, get my tasting notes and whatnot. And we'd go through bourbons and ryes, and, and we fell into a handful of, you know, just honey barrel ryes. Insanely yeah. good stuff. It was probably about five or six years old at that time. And we kind of set them aside. We've been babying them. They've been getting older and older and better and better. And then I guess it was a year or two ago, you know, they kind of forecast pretty long term for those master's keeps. Right. Um, Dad came to me, and he was like, you know, what ideas would you have? What, you know, let's see what I've got. Let's see what you've got. Let's see kind of where it comes together. And then we came up with a bunch of ideas. Uh, I think during that meeting a few years ago, it might have been the first time we ever talked about, you know, aging in a secondary barrel, which ended up being revival. But then yeah. we kept coming back to, what about those two barrels? They're now 11-year-old, but I guess at that time they've been eight or nine. What about those two barrels? That's the best tasting stuff we have on site. Because I finally got him into the rye. Uh, as well <laughs> and then he eventually was just like I want to take all the sister barrels from that lot around the same age right around 11 years old put them into a bottle and release them as a, as a master's key and uh, it, that stuff's awesome um, it's got I think a lot of the best parts yeah. of those two or three barrels they're still sitting around uh, ooh, ooh, you know we're still experimenting ooh, on them okay. yeah. oh okay <laughs> so what I'm hearing What's is uh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah come hang out there's something in the future yeah, no yeah. doubt was your dad as hard to kind of persuade to do something different as Jimmy? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> I am probably more traditional than my dad is. Really? Uh, to be honest, yeah. Uh, my palate aligns a lot more with my grandfather's yeah. than it does with my dad's as far as, like, what bourbon I'm kind of into. Mm -hmm. um, that Jimmy does not like rye whiskey at all, even the stuff we make. Uh, he's just yeah. not a rye whiskey fan. Yeah. He likes, he's bourbon uh, through and through. But dad... I don't think I could come up with a weird enough idea for Dad not to be behind it, as long as it wasn't kind of against the uh, the DNA of like what wild turkey is. He doesn't. He wouldn't. You know, if I was like, let's do a blueberry bubblegum flavored. Yeah, he'd be thing. like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whoa, 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 settle down. But <laughs> as far as just straight whiskey is concerned, he usually has the more out there ideas compared to me. Okay. Could you talk about some, maybe some of those ideas that like. Where you're like, whoa, that is a little further than yeah, what we, I would we, go for. I'm sure we can't get too deep into it. Uh, I can talk about stuff that we've tried in the past, and we have a lot of yeah, stuff kind of yeah, in the works right. now. Absolutely. Yeah, go for um, it. But stuff that kind of like didn't come to fruition, and um, I think Dad had a say in some of this stuff. And then uh, at Wild Turkey, we have a, um, a technical team, uh, two people specifically, uh, Norm and, and Shaylin. Um, really help us kind of develop a lot of these flavors but through their technical team they had worked on um, some sage infused stuff um, they had worked on my favorite one they had worked on was we had taken a, a barrel that had had beer aged inside of it a used bourbon barrel that had beer and then we got the barrel back and then reintroduced whiskey into the barrel that had beer in it mm -hmm. ah really dug that product mm -hmm. nobody else did <laughs> uh, uh, but that's just the kind of stuff where um, I think it, it, why it's good to have people like us at the distillery that really do want to like make a million new things and, and try all this kind of new stuff. And then it also pays off to have kind of like people like Jimmy or the company that are 
their first answer is going to be no. Our first answer is yes to everything. And so you kind of have to meet in the middle. Like, we probably didn't need that beer-flavored whiskey, you know. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, Turkey is founded on tradition. Absolutely. Right? I mean, it, it, you know, Jimmy's been there for 65 years. Well, Dad, it's we've been open since the 1860s-ish. Yes. Um, right there in Anderson County, what we kind of claim is our founding distillery. And yeah. I think Dad's only the fourth master distiller we've ever had. Right. Yeah. You right. know, that's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, like it, it, it makes sense that there is a little bit more of hesitancy to, you know, do something really different outside of a straight bourbon, a straight rye. Oh, absolutely. But I I love hearing that there is that possibility for things to change. I mean, the the fact that there is a, I I assume you're talking about the Anderson Valley mm-hmm. beer, right? So the fact that that exists in the world. I mean, that that is taking the love of wild turkey to another degree that you know, 20 years ago, didn't exist. And to know that there is some innovation still left to be talked about with wild turkey, I, that's exciting. And bourbon in me. general, too. Well, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I want to see, and, you know, one-on-one is my daily drink. That is nice. my, my go-to when I, I people ask, you know, what what are you normally sipping on? It's one-on-one. But to see the Wild Turkey brand go above and beyond what it is now, that to me is fascinating and really, really exciting. And yeah, I, I think I, we're I, in like a cool position where a lot of other distilleries have been doing experimentation and innovation for a while. Yeah. And we're just now, really since Master's Keep came about, really trying to push that stuff. Yeah. Um, that if you're a Wild Turkey fan, it's the best time in history to be a Wild Turkey fan. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're now getting into that stuff. So you, everybody that's a fan now kind of gets to be on the ground floor of the, the beginnings of our innovation and mm-hmm. uh, doing cool yearly releases and that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I just think that there is something so exciting about the new blood in the whiskey industry right now. You know, I, I've been tossing this idea around for a while of doing a... Uh, th- so having, like, the the current masters in bourbon and then the future masters. And I think that, Bruce, you're, you're kind of part of that as well, that, you, you know, you have something to add to the future, not just of wild turkey, but of bourbon and rye. Uh, in general, and I, I, I'm really excited to see where you go uh, in the future. But it, what what is your kind of ideal? What's what's your ideal, or maybe not ideal, um, but what's your like your vision for Wild Turkey moving forward? Yeah. So I guess to to start, I'm really excited. Before I get into the Wild Turkey stuff, I'm really excited about my generation of, of the people like coming up uh, yeah. as a whole and you know maybe it's not generation by age because I also lump a lot of these um, not only like new burgeoning distillers but also um, either just new people in the industry or new distilleries like if you just look at either the the younger guard of people right um the you know me the Hendersons uh, over at Angels, Freddie over at, at at Jim Beam. Um, you've got Drew doing crazy cool stuff over at Willet, yep. and then some uh, Jackie over at uh, Old Forester. You've got uh, some crazy cool like what started off as kind of mom and pop places that are now getting a lot of pub. Yeah, for sure. Um, like a Willet or uh, even newer like a Peerless or even you know. Uh, smaller maybe like a wilderness trail everybody's doing such cool stuff and uh, I, I think that we're going to kind of push each other because mm-hmm. uh, I don't you know I do love to drink standards but when I'm drinking to compare I am drinking kind of the stuff like the little book or stuff like the stuff that Willett's doing or um, wilderness trail or any of the limited edition old forces that come out it's it's that kind of stuff I'm interested in. It's the people that are kind of pushing things into into weirder directions, and, uh, and I'm trying to figure out maybe what I can do. Because I'm very lucky. 
we come from a foundation at Wild Turkey. I don't have to do much to keep things going. <laughs> like, yeah. Jimmy figured all that out for us, <laughs> and I feel right. very lucky. Like right. he he nailed one on one. One on one is what it is. Absolutely, it's going to be around an eight year old blend, hundred one proof. That's never going to change. This is what I've been saying. I've been talking about this for ages now yeah. about why one on one is. My, I think my I think toe to toe with any other what you would consider kind of the benchmark product right. at that distillery of the big distilleries. It's tough to beat, man. It's almost twice as old. It's higher proof. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a killer product. But like Rare Breed, Kentucky Spirit, these things that have been around now for decades, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. So Absolutely. Uh, at Wild Turkey, we very, feel very blessed that we don't have to s- screw around with that stuff. Yeah. But it gives us the opportunity to then, cool, we know one-on-one and, and Rare Breed and the Russell stuff's all going to be cool. Now let's try a master's keep. Let's try yeah. a cool funky rock. Let's innovative. try the long branch. We never thought that we would do a product that was geared towards um, maybe not a beginning consumer, but someone that wants something more light, more delicate. Right. We are not light and delicate at Wild Turkey for the most part. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely oh, no. not. We are the oh, opposite yeah. of that. We are yes, aggressive, yeah. bold, in your face. Yeah. You know you're drinking Wild Turkey oh, when you're drinking it. As you should be. But long yeah. branch isn't like that. And just the the fact that Campari as a parent company has allowed us to kind of branch out and do these different things right. gives me a lot of hope in the future that if I want to do a cool funky weird barrel aged dry yeah they're gonna let me I'm excited or they're at least gonna too. give us the opportunity to try that stuff for yeah. sure yeah. yeah Bruce thank you so much for sitting well, of down course. with us man the, the, I I feel like we have like two hours worth of content that we could get out of course just talking about what you want to do with wild turkey in the future but oh yeah we'll, we'll, rah rah more rah we'll set that <laughs> yeah <laughs> the rah guy yeah. We'll, we'll set that up in the future but thank you so much thank man. you all it, it's great to talk to you all yeah absolutely. hope y'all had a good time uh, at the festival this weekend oh man it's been a great weekend yeah definitely yeah. Nice. Yeah. cheers thanks guys cheers thank so apparently apparently I <laughs> yeah, you, you spoke before I introduced you, but you know it's fine. No, it's it. You're breaking podcast etiquette, but it, it, it's fu- it's fine. Oh whatever, wait, whatever. I'll, I'll do that when I. <laughs> I'll do that whenever I show up on uh, on Kentucky Music Preview. Exactly. Um, but this is Haley. Hello. From Wilderness Trail, you are now apparently, I guess, like a staple whenever we do. We, festivals. We keep just running podcast. into each other. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we I, have uh, to stop meeting like this. We must, right? uh, <laughs> darling, we must be really now. Uh, yeah, that's that seems to be the the trend though. Is yeah, that, no kidding. Uh, we're just, it just happens. It just happens, and it, and and when it does, it's magic, and Absolutely. it's and it's uh, it's beautiful. Uh, but yeah, and then you know. Whatever, I might break a few rules when it comes to pot. I run a podcast. I can break rules. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. You, yeah. you understand. Yeah. 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 No, I, I will definitely break rules whenever yeah. I wind up on. And this is the first time I've met Haley. So, Hi. Yes. Oh, you haven't met Haley. Yeah. Well, I met her oh. yesterday, but not. Oh, no that's true. Not form, yes. yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. We didn't have the whole sit down. Yeah. <laughs> chat yeah. Thing. yeah. We didn't have the chat. Exactly. So it's interesting because there's not a whole lot to talk about with Wilderness Trail right now because we've already talked about. All the new things that all, have been happening all the with happenings. you guys, the, yeah. the, the high ride bourbon, all the single barrels that are coming out too. Yeah. So I figured maybe we'll talk more about the music okay. from this weekend. Yeah. I like that. Um, I know my favorite so far, but what's been your favorite performance Thus this far? Weekend? Yeah. Um, well, goodness. <laughs> oh, um... I did. Uh, it's hard to say. Flaming Lips always puts on a great show, there right? There we go. That, that, that's my favorite. We were just talking yeah. about that. That's, that's been always going to be phenomenal. I don't think anyone. I've never heard anybody say, "Oh yeah, I saw a Flaming Lips concert and it was a total and it was dud." Yeah. 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 Fell asleep. What a snore, <laughs> snore bore. Um, no, and so they and I love the. Uh, do you have the explicit? Can I say what the? Oh, you can go for it. Yeah. yeah the the fuck yeah Louisville balloons. Oh yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, that, that was. was so Oh, great. That was that a good was touch. Phenomenal. <laughs> they that had was the, an... like eyeballs too. Yeah. And, <laughs> and like, what I love about all that is like, it's not high tech stuff. You know, he got oh, a, no. he got a balloon Absolutely made, not. and but it was enough to for me to be like, that's right, exactly. That's Wayne Coy's got it going on. You know. Yeah. So yeah. that was really good. Um, it's funny because. Uh, Jenny Lewis is a human I love, but I don't love her music. 
Okay. I love her, like, her early stuff when she was, like, with, uh, like, Relo Kelly and people like that. Okay. Um, but I... I love her. I love her like Fort Lonesome suits with like the like the pot leaves going down and all like the cool stuff like that. Take yeah. take that how you will. It's fine. Sure. But um, yeah. yeah. But she's she's a total she's a total bad babe. But I cannot get a hold of like a lot of her new music. music. But that being said, her performance yesterday was stellar. Yeah. Grace Potter. Oh, I she's, love Grace Potter so much. Wow, she oh. is a rock and roll queen. Yeah. Oh my God! She, she, uh, I think, is the hidden gem, totally, of the rock and roll industry right oh now. Oh my God! I mean, she, if given the opportunity, she will be huge. And it's amazing because she's she's been around for the, a, a long time. Oh yeah! And oh, it, yeah. and it's insane because you hear her music and she, you know, you're hearing like. Skinnered like you know crazy guitar riffs like you know what yeah. I mean just these like very oh, yeah. like absolutely classic rock just shredding you know awesomeness yeah. and uh, you know Jimmy Page kind of style stuff too and you're just like why are you not insanely famous right now yeah. but also thanks for not being because now I can see you and afford to see oh, you like, like, oh my god my ten dollar <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> I, I feel the same way about Anderson East oh my yes oh. Anderson East he he is. I, he has been my favorite recently, but really for about a, like a year and a half, two years sure. at this point. Yeah. But like, I I want him to succeed. Right. But I also want to still be able to go see him at the borough. I need my pay grade to be to match. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or at uh, at uh, Manchester. Yes, you know, at it, least. Yeah, honestly, I mean he, he's just he's so good at what he does, and it, I again want him to go above and beyond yeah these these smaller venues but like come home shoot man <laughs> come hang out like, with yeah, us let, let, let's do a club gig together or something do a little you know? something on like, the side wanna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a little more intimate setting but that that is something that I I feel like we don't talk enough about with, with artists with musical artists is that like there's that weird dichotomy of you know I want you to do well but I don't want you to do so well that you outgrow me yes you Honestly, know? yeah. And, and and I I haven't gotten to that point with with musicians that I love or, or that I follow um, sure. to where they have outgrown me, but I I kind of fear that there, a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, because you think about you know, I mean, anytime you become a mainstream. Or not mainstream, but you, anytime you hit the hit whatever oh, big yeah. time your yeah. genre oh, yeah. is, you know, like you suddenly become, you know, ticket price wise, do I pay my bills this month or do I go <laughs> see this band? Who knows? It's not that cold. Who needs heat? It's uh, fine, you know. Um, but yeah, no, there is that fear. Well, and especially if there are artists that you have followed for since their their infancy as yeah. a you know what I mean and so that's the hard part is because you know like if you if you fell in love with an artist once they were already big then they're already big and you're already just kind of like oh yeah those are those guys yeah. but they, there's that there's that whole like I've been with you since you were playing on this size stage I, my favorite one I always reference is I saw um, well that St. Paul and the Broken Bones oh heck yes so I saw them play at Zanzibar years ago um, this is probably spoken I saw, with experience yes. yeah that's a you're too young to know these days. I hate what? when people say wow. that. And wow. I'm like, listen, am I or did I always have a fake? Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, so, he, but I saw Zanzibar, I saw them play at Zanzibar. I, I, I would say at least uh, at this point, like seven years ago. And Zanzibar, especially before their their um, remodel they had, they had a very small stage. It was, you know, I mean, no exaggeration, it, no more than two feet off the ground. You yes, know what geez. I mean? And it, it, was, it was a very small stage. And it was, but I mean, 
It was an awesome show. It was one of those where like you were right up front, like St. Paul sweat like flung off and hit my arm, and I was like, whoa, this is Never rad. This <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I was like, well, whoever this guy is, and he, he you Selling know, this on eBay. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, and he was he was still virtually small. Yeah. Obviously, if you're playing it, you know, on that size stage compared to where he's playing now, you know, but it's one of those where I'm like, gosh, I, I, I could have touched him on the right, first show yeah. I ever saw, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, oh, yeah, and now sure. he's yeah. he's selling out music festivals and on, on you know, big arena size stages and, you and feel things like, like that. like a sense of ownership a little bit, too? You're like, there is. Oh, but, like, sure. I've, I helped you get there. But, like, those tickets, like, I bought those tickets, okay? And... You might have missed a few meals without it, and you could have died. Yeah, you could have died. This for is me. Oh, oh, okay, we're getting that existential. Gonna, I'm gonna go far. It's fine. <laughs> I'm going to claim that much love, ownership. I, yeah, no, the, yeah. There it's is definitely even, that much ownership. It's not you, even yeah. your career anymore. It's your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually your life because of me. And you're uh, congratulations, <laughs> I saved you. Yeah. No, but Are even you then. Sorry, Haley, who? Who, excuse me? <laughs> yeah. So this is going to be an odd, and an odd one especially, is Tyler Childers. So how, is, how is that odd? So, so no, not because of his success. Oh, okay. I was like, he, he's... Huge he's now. huge, yeah. yeah, absolutely. He's a I big, mean, he's he's big on Fallon. Guy. He's you know, I mean, oh. he, he's everywhere. Oh, oh, oh. So speaking of that, yeah. Um, so I used to do a, a, a blues cover band. Okay. Right. Look at and you. Our uh, our keyboard player uh -huh. Chase Lewis uh, is now playing keys <gasps> for Tyler Childers. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to watch him on Jimmy Fallon, that's oh, cool. and that's I was like, so "This cool. is this is amazing." Yeah. Oh, anyway, my. sorry. So, so what's Tyler your ownership Childers? there, though? Where you're just like, "Listen." My ownership is that I was a small blip on the radar that was. Sure. <laughs> that's <laughs> how I. That's true. Really how it journey. is. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Anyway. I, I uh, so I used to run this event called the Night Market in Lexington, and still oh, yeah, it's still it's happening still to this day. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was the director of that event for about three years, and. Um, and it was a it was a really cool experience, a good time. But as you know, there's a lot of live music that happens at yes. those events. Yep. And um, for anybody who doesn't know, the night market's like a street festival that happens once a month on the first Friday, and it's like all local vendors and food, and it's it's a good time. Um, and it's still continuing this day. And yeah. so, but the early on. Um, you know, I was working with uh, another local artist in town, James Friley, who does uh, Idiot Gleam, and helping with our booking um, and stuff like that. And so he does a lot of videographer work and whatever. Anyway, point is, we were working together on booking, and, and uh, we booked this band for the November night market. November or December. It was cold. <laughs> it was cold. Yes, of course it was. And uh, and uh, it was um, Tyler Childers huh. and his backup oh. band. Oh, okay. And he played at the Night Market, uh, which is... And what he, year is this? This is, this is 20... Oh, gosh. This is like probably like 2014, okay. I would Ooh. say. And 2013, 2014, something like yeah. that. And um, so right before he hit. Right before he hit, and right yeah. before he even like, when, like even kind of started doing bigger tours or right. anything like that. And yeah. so he, so yeah, so he agreed to do. You know, he did it. It's his whole band. I got to meet all of them. He cursed me on stage several times for it being so cold, and uh, oh, which oh. I don't blame him. Oh, good. No, I was totally like, <laughs> listen, I don't blame you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wonder I, if he remembers that. I don't know. I don't know if he does or not. Um, I, like, I know. I know. I know a couple of people like kind of like you, or like I know his drummer and I know his the, his former manager. Yeah, and it, it's all that six degrees of separation. Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of but I don't know yeah. Tyler at all. Like, and I'll no. never, I'll never claim to know him until we, have you know, <laughs> sat down or something. But otherwise, oh, I don't that know. would be great for your show. Oh, I would love that. Oh my god, Tyler, if you're listening. All right, we're I don't gonna know start a campaign. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure we have that. Use listener. the hashtag. <laughs> 
we're here. Uh, we're going to use the hashtag get Tyler to KY Music Preview. I yeah. like it. So. I like it. It's quick. It's catchy. It's snappy. It's, it's hot. Snappy. You know, yeah. it's going it, to It's going to happen. It's got legs for sure. But I do. I remember that moment and, and, and you know, like liking the music, but not really knowing. Obviously, you don't know. Right. I would never have guessed years later, you know, here he is on Fallon or here he is at Railbird with 40,000 people watching his band play. And Kentucky's so weird uh, yeah. about the art scene. <laughs> yeah. well, Kentucky's weird, In yeah. general, I was but, like, yes. But sure. it's so weird about its own people. Yeah, You know, sure. they, they, it, I, I don't know what it is, but it just feels like there is never that support behind the people that matter. That are like really well, and that's I mean that's one of the reasons why I you know with Kentucky Music Preview that's one of the reasons yeah. why we started it is because we were out of sheer frustration almost of just being like no one's oh, going yeah. to these shows, mm -hmm. no one knows about these shows, like yeah. no one's marketing them, you know all these things. And it was like here we have these gems of artists that you know if they could just get in front of the right ears would probably. Right. You know, Make be it, the next yeah. Tyler, be the next, you know, oh, Sturgill, sure. be the next whoever, sure. you know, and, uh, and yeah, it's one of those where it's like, where y'all at? <laughs> <laughs> like, I know on. you're out Where's there. Where's that support, y'all? Where y'all at? Yeah. Leave your house, go, go buy the ticket, go hang That's out. That's the problem. They're still in the holler, just like, I, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to leave, I don't, don't want to drive there. I enjoy well, my life. I, I, I think the core of what we're getting at at this point is support. Either way, artists. through and through, yeah. Not, not yeah. even just musicians, but like real, you know, local talent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, you, you should take some kind of ownership in that. I mean, it. it and it, yeah, and ever well, I think anything that's produced locally needs to have a strong army behind it to support it. You yeah, know, yeah. especially like not to get too like over the top, but like in the days of Amazon, where you know. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm totally, totally, I'm totally, I'm totally the same that. person. I literally contemplated buying soil off of Amazon so I could pot <laughs> my plants because I didn't want to go to Lowe's, which is so awful to say. So I. I'm, I am a total product of all of that guilty as charged. No, yeah, I feel that too. But, like, you know, that being said, there, I mean, down to, down to podcasts, down to breweries, down to yeah. uh, restaurants, distilleries. Danville, you know, Wilderness Trail, you know, we're in Danville, Kentucky. We have a population of less than 30,000 people there. Not much going on. I'm yeah. to throw that out there. No, no shade. I grew up there. I get it. Haley, how many bourbon podcasts do you think are out of Lexington? One. One. Yes. One bourbon podcast right. out of Lexington. It, that, that's us. How, I didn't even know that. No, dude. There, really? there is nobody what? else in Lexington that no is doing, doing bourbon it. podcasts. That's yeah. wild. And I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't care if somebody else crops up. You know, I sure. encourage that. It's all about the community. Yeah. Right? But, like, why are but you not famous? It's, it's Central <laughs> Kentucky. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Like, it's not that at all. It's just, why why are there not more people in Central Kentucky going, we, we should we do should something. something, you know? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it just baffles me that we're the only one. Yeah. I mean, right. I think it has to go back to, like, just a whole history lesson that we won't get into today. But <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, well, I got that like, well, That's true. I think it's a that whole is also lot of true. Yeah, back, but my backstory there. But. My point is that you know, I I think that without that backing, yes, people don't feel the encouragement to do Keep something going. they might have a passion for. to pursue that. Yeah, you know? exactly. I, and man, we're gonna get real deep. Here no, for I a like second. it. Let's but go. Like, I'm like leaning like, in. Like, yeah, Lexington sucks for a music scene. It is a an absolute pit of waste for music and it's not it's not that the people who are making the music suck I was going to fight you on that no 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 it's <laughs> no. Th there is great music coming out but it's there is lost no on, support it's lost on the people it there absolutely is yes, because all yes. they want to do is they want to go out and they want to listen to cover bands oh yeah and they it, th there's just nothing to facilitate creativity yes no you're 100 it is lost on it is lost on that 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 audience is yeah. totally lost on that audience. It's totally lost on Kentucky audience. I mean, I think so too. You know, like in general, like and it's just 
it's a shame because it is awesome, awesome music coming out of, you know, uh, and like, you know, not to even pigeonhole music. There's so much good stuff coming out of Kentucky. Oh, for sure. And it's lost on its own citizens. Yeah. And that's the shame. It's like, I'll get vi- visitors, you know, with, with, through the bourbon industry, through the trail, and they are in awe of all these things happening here. That I'm like, thank God, because let me tell you, Joe Schmo down the street sure doesn't care. Like, you know, <laughs> and it's, and I know that's such a bitter, like, that's such a bitter outlook on it, but it's so frustrating. It's it so is. frustrating. Yeah. Because there are people like you doing what you do oh. and getting out there. Well, it's true. Oh, I mean, you guys, you. you know, this isn't, you know, you, you know, this isn't out of, out of sheer just love for the attention, love for the money, love for whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like you love bourbon and you love what's happening here. And bourbon is just so happens to be one of the largest industries that are coming up in the state, you know? Like um but you're doing it because you love it. You're doing it out of love of it. You're doing it out of creating creating a network, creating a community that loves that and it's it's just a shame what happens when it's just lost on people that are you know, in that backyard and yeah. don't don't appreciate it. I don't it. know if it's something like, oh, well, it's always been here, like, you know, kind of mentality, but uh, I don't I don't buy that. Like, yeah. I don't that, either. Yeah, that yeah. excuse. I don't, I don't either. No, that, don't give them excuses. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. don't allow excuses. Yeah, don't even it's, give them room yeah, for it. No, I get that, though. And it is. It's frustrating. But, I, but that being said, you know, like, maybe you're a pioneer you know maybe we're pioneers in and starting a new you know a new wave of just getting people shaking them shaking them by the boots and saying hey get up get out let's go you know yeah like that that mentality of of um just kind of not being an active person you know being a being just a just a just a schmuck in the crowd you can't do that anymore you know like you gotta you gotta stand up and you gotta do your thing and you gotta have people to follow you on it so for those of you listening Get up wow, out this of your was, chairs. Yeah, get up, this get was out. a lot more passionate than I thought it was. It did. We were just going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, hear me. <laughs> Listen to Listen me. To me. <laughs> Haley, thank you so much for this sitting down. It's always a pleasure to get to see <laughs> yes, you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having go, me. Everybody go see Wilderness Trail. Yes. Yeah, go check out the distillery. Drink their bourbon and their rye, for that matter, too. So. Specifically. Yeah, 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 well. <laughs> He doesn't have favorites. It's fine. No, no, no. It's all good. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Fawn Weaver from Uncle Nearest is back. Yes, I am. Hi, Fawn. Hello. How have you been? I've been great. You've been busy. I've been incredibly busy. So, I'm sorry. Uh, Jackie Jackie, is telling you to just looked at me and was like, uh, hey, we've been trying to sit down for, like, the entire weekend. And, you know, We'll, we'll make it happen. It's are, all good. Are you yeah, okay? No. no, no, no. It's all good. No, okay. she's going to, we'll filter her in when the time comes. All right. Yeah, but no, it's, we're, we're, we're going to talk about Uncle Nearest right now because awesome. that's what's important. Um, goodness gracious, you guys have had, um, like I said, a thousand different things One happen. One hell of a year, yeah. So, goodness gracious. Um, first and foremost, the Visitor Center. Yes. Yeah, that that is hugely exciting for you guys. It's beautiful. It's yeah. it really is. And people come in and they see the level of excellence that we are building out our distillery. And it's very very rare. I don't even Peggy knows Stevens who has built out a lot of visitor centers yes. and a lot of distilleries. She said she doesn't know of any that has ever done what we did, which is we have a four phase, four year build out and we decided to open up after the first year and to allow for our consumers to go a lot what we call our whiskey family to go on this journey with yes. us and so we opened up phase one our bottling house our visitor center uh, our tasting room and we opened all of that up and I mean I think 3,000 people showed up so <laughs> that, that's a good indication, though. I, I mean, right? It's a very good indication. Yeah. No, I, I think that that is so cool to see. I mean, we were talking last year about the the small number of states that you guys were in. The, yeah. that, that really, really small market. Right. 
it's expanded so much. We're in all 50. Then. That, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> we're, all, we're in all 50 and you, in 10 were, states outside of the U.S. I mean, September last year, you were in I don't, 20? Uh, I probably, maybe, I don't know if we were in that many by then, but sure. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that that is just fantastic to me that you guys have, have done everything that you have to get to this point. And I, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see the expansion that you all have experienced and, Thank and you. everything. But let's talk about the whiskey a little bit. Let's do too. it. Yeah, so we have two expressions in front of us, the 1856 and the 1884. Um, the 18, uh, Excuse me, the 1856 is kind of your more, I would say, what is like your... your our core? Predominant. Well, you know, the irony is, is that 1856 has been our core, and 1884 right, yeah. has come out of the gate swinging. Uh, we're now selling about 50-50 in each of the states. So oh, wow. It is, it is quickly, quickly growing popularity. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll taste a little bit and talk about it All right. as well, too. So um, I started with the 1856, All right. uh, which is on, go. Yes, on our left. Cheers. Uh, thanks to Richie. Yes, cheers to you as well. So this is a whiskey. It's not a bourbon. It is. Well, so Tennessee whiskey is straight bourbon. Yes. Legal definition right. and in the process. The right. only difference, only difference between Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey is what Nearest Green taught. It's what he helped to perfect. It's a filtration right. process. It doesn't add anything. It only removes. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and so, it's removing fusel oils. It, it's literally removing the crap you don't want in whiskey. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. But... It, Regardless of whether or not you're removing anything from the whiskey, this is so full-bodied. Yes. I, I, I think that this has so much to it that is really quite a, a, a delicate bouquet of flavors. And, I mean, it, yeah. it, it you know, it, last year I tried it for the first time with you. Yes. I, I, I tried it for the very, very first time sitting right next to you. Yeah. And harped on how much I, I, I loved it. And really, I still feel the exact same way. Love I, it. I, I think that it is a very exceptional whiskey. Well, the irony is, is when you tasted it last year, it was a blend of eight to 11 year old. Now we've actually adjusted the blend a little bit. It's now a blend between eight and 14 year old. And so really? it's the depth that you're getting is, it, it was there before, but you are going to get a little bit more depth because of the amount of time that some of these barrels that have been blended in have been sitting in Tennessee. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I, I don't quite remember the, the fruitiness. Yes. Well, you know, from, from barrel to barrel, everything is different. Right. Everything changes. And for us, I don't know how many other distilleries are out there like this, but our whiskey goes in at a very low proof. So Nearest Green, yes. at the time that he was alive, the maximum was 110. So he was putting it in the barrel at 110 and he was proofing right. it down. So we do our best to follow that process of proofing it down. So most of our barrels, when we are actually releasing the whiskey from the barrels, it's anywhere between 100 and 105 proof. So the amount of water we're adding to 1856 is very, very little. So it's, it's pretty close to a cast strength. That is, I love that. I, re, I really, truly do because I always kind of talk about barrel strength bourbon or barrel strength whiskey as like the, the, the ideal product that the master distiller intended. Yeah. Right? And, and so even though it is, it, it, it's got a little bit of water added to it, that doesn't seem like it detracts too much from the original no. intention. No, and, that and that's the entire point, because when we did our research and trying to figure out what was the proof, and this is actually a good segue into 1884, yes. when I reached out to Clay Reisner of the New York Times, Fred Minnick, Peggy No, Stevens, a few others that I know have been researching whiskey for a long time to try to figure out what was the proof that people in the marketplace that were tasting Nearest's whiskey before 1884, or 1884 is the year that we believe Nearest, it, the last year he put his own whiskey into a barrel. Jack moved in 1885, 
to uh, the new distillery that he's at, and Nears did not go with him. Right. And so 1884 is the last year we believe that he put his own whiskey into barrels. Interesting. But when, you, when you're looking at that date and that time and the fact that they were selling actual barrels and then it was going to the distributor, and the distributor is who was adding right. water, yeah. the question became, what do you think that the actual consumer was getting? Mm -hmm. And they believe that it was anywhere between 92 and 94 proof. So that is the reason 1884 is a lighter body, and it's at 93 proof. Now, uh, as you're tasting this, yes. I want to give you a little bit of background on 1884. Yes, yeah. Is this particular one, it is small batch. I hand select every barrel, okay. and then it goes before a tasting panel that is chaired by Nears Green's descendants. And it is Nears really? Green's descendants that actually determined the blend. And so they will say, this barrel is in, this barrel is out, this barrel is in, this barrel is out. And we give them no direction as to how they choose their barrel. It is based on their own taste profile and my belief that whiskey is in their blood. So if you look on the back of the bottle, the descendant who blended this her signature is oh on the gosh. back. And every bottle of 1884, you can tell what Descendants palette has curated and blended this, is you're able to tell that because of the signature on the back. That is so wild to me. I mean, like, I, I, I think about, too, you know, maybe they have something, like, deeply ingrained in them that is indicative of what that palette of whiskey was like. At the time, but absolutely, like, it, it, it this sounds like they're just going in blind. <laughs> well, listen, you know they go in, and again, it is my belief that a legacy like that does not stop at mm -hmm. that person and it comes down and it continues to come down our head of whiskey operations is a descendant of jack so it is something right. that i think continues in these families mm -hmm. and so when she chose this blend every single competition we have entered has won either gold or double gold sorry i'm i'm also enjoying this <laughs> as, <laughs> as we're talking about it Really, I am truly enjoying it. I, I think that the finish yeah. is spectacular. It's a, it's a nice sipper, right? It, Needs right, yeah. nothing it, added. It, it's, it's nothing really too intrusive up front, mm -hmm. which is a, an, an odd way of putting it, but it doesn't kind of, it, it doesn't abuse your palate. Right. Yeah, but the, the finish, though, <laughs> That's where it feels more like a bourbon. Yes. To me. That's I think when the that 1884 really comes feels and tastes more like a bourbon is one of the yes. things that we have heard. And a lot of, of the bartenders, ironically, this is the first place we saw we began hearing it in LA, is you had a lot of bartenders going, Whoa, this is really similar to Blanton's and utilizing it in different drinks that they Same used proof, to. Same proof, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> it is. And so this is the one that people are shocked that it is. Uh, it's out of Tennessee. But people have to remember, we're sitting on the same limestone shelf as Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So our whiskey is essentially just the same. So it is just a matter of what we do with it in Tennessee. And for 1884, what we did is the same thing they do in Kentucky with the bourbons. That is daggum good. <laughs> I mean, really. I, I... <sighs> All right. I think I might have to stop by the liquor store on the way out of here and, and, and pick up a bottle 1884 of that, just arrived in Kentucky about a week or two ago. Oh. So you got it here. So there's, there should be plenty. Yes. I hope yeah. so. It depends. 1884 <laughs> so is fl absolutely flying off the shelves. Oh, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Fawn Weaver, thank you so much thank for you sitting for having with me, me. Again. It's been so good to see you again. Thank you. Um, I need to make my way down to Tennessee. Yes. And actually you got to come on the tour. Yo, I, I, I do a founders tour every Saturday at four o'clock. I lead it. Okay. And then we end it at our Toppy's bar on the distillery. Oh. And we've built out a patio. The most beautiful sunset in Tennessee happens on the southwest corner yes. of our ranch. And so we literally built out a patio where everyone just comes and they grab a drink and sit and watch the sunset. Love and it. it turns the entire sky copper. So we call it our copper skies oh. moment. Oh. I love that so yeah. much. That's perfect. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank you for having Uncle me. All the best, Uncle Thank yes, you. For sure. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh, I am so happy to have the very exhausted oh, and don't worn start to the bone. With no, that. no, I am absolutely going to Jackie's. I can. <laughs>
exhausted, but for good cause, it's right? It's a good reason. Yeah. It is. Bourbon and Beyond yeah. is amazing. It's an amazing festival, oh, and everyone's it, out here been... just busting ass to make it all happen oh, yeah. and spread the good word Absolutely. of brown juice. So yeah and, yeah, and look, no more so than Fred Minnick. Oh, I no mean, one he, ever more so than Fred Minnick. He, he has absolutely pulled out all the stops. He's so committed, too. You see that guy? He's walking around in his suit jacket. It's 100 degrees out. He's got his ascot got on. Ascot? You know he's miserable. What's up with that? <laughs> I, no, I know. I give Fred Minnick so much shit for no, that I, ascot, I but everyone him does, so much. too. It's he's okay. He's one of my favorite people. So you are the master taster. Yes. At Old Forester. At Old Forester, that yes. That sounds like the hardest job in the world. Your sarcasm is really <laughs> just on fire it right cuts now. cuts through, right? Um, yeah. So, okay, but let's think of it this way. Everyone says, that, oh, how do I get your job? You oh, have I a dream know. job. Oh, yeah, 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 it takes time. It's a great job. It's yeah. a great job, and I, you know, any job's a great job when you love what you do, but it's still a job, and it's still... Oh, it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah. so there's still challenges with it, but, you know, it does come with some really good whiskey, so, <laughs> hey, no complaints. I mean, you're not drinking all day. You're... Tasting. No, you know, yeah, laying exactly. around drinking it out See, of the that, bottle. All that's day. the thing that I think people don't realize is that it's not it's not just going into work and getting schmammered for eight hours, nine no, hours out of the no. day. You're, it's actually quite quite the opposite. I'm yeah. the only person in the room that's not allowed to be drunk, to be perfectly <laughs> honest with you. No. So you go and you do events, you do tastings and we do all kinds of things. And everyone's there enjoying our products, hopefully responsibly. Um, we do our best to set that up. But yes. No, you can't. As when you serve as sort of a face of a brand, that's just not an option anymore. And your relationship with alcohol definitely changes. Um, I can't drink whiskey anymore and not, you know, sort of have that Pavlov's dog response of like, I'm at work, I'm at work, and the stress level just fires up, <laughs> right? So, I don't know. It's hard on your body. It's hard on your mind. Um, it it took a lot to get here. I spent a lot of time in the bar industry before this and was working about 92 hours a week as a bev director and picking up stuff on the side after that and then here you're no you never clock out right you know what i mean like you don't yeah. like it just doesn't stop i'm not complaining i'm complaining am i, I complaining I, I, no you're not i, I don't i'm just being honest you might be a it. little bit but i mean but i think cares? it's important for people to realize that it you is. know so yeah. it's it's not what you think. It's not a party. <laughs> it is a job. If we were all getting schmammered all the time, trust me, the whiskey in the bottle wouldn't be as good as thank it you, is. Thank no you one for using that word. Schmammered. It, yeah, that, that's <laughs> something that I've incorporated into my vernacular. Mm. So one of the biggest successes, though, of Old Forester over the past year has been the 1910. Oh, oh my God. I, I, right? I, I, I say that very, very lightly <laughs> because y'all sold out in six weeks. So Six weeks. Right. <laughs> No. Okay. So the Whiskey Row series has been an interesting journey. Yes. When the 1870, that first one came out, everybody kind of was like, why is there an expensive Olfo? I don't get it. I can get the 100 proof cheaper than this one. Why am I paying extra? Um, there's reasons for it, but just for the sake of this, it's focus. 1897 comes out and they're like, oh, okay, there's another expensive one. Right. Not expensive in the grain segment bourbon, but for Old Forester, mm -hmm. it was higher priced than the core. Yeah. But the two flavor profiles were so polarizing that I think it was very, you choose one or the other and that was it. When 1920 dropped, I mean, right. That was the game changer. It was the game changer. Yeah. All of a sudden there's a flight, all of a sudden there's a series and people started paying attention because now you start building that back bar billboard, if you will, right? And so right. when we went to plan, do demand planning for the 1910, we based that first year's release number off of a first, off of the highest level of 1920 sales numbers, thinking yeah. we'll be safe. No way could it be as successful as 1920. That entire year's supply sold out from us. We shipped it all out in three weeks. <laughs> and we were like, Jeez. oh, shit. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> There's nothing left. But it's a finished product, so we can't just go more, pluck more off a tree. You uh, know, yeah. It's got to sit in a secondary barrel for about nine months. Well, there, there's something, too, about the, I, I, I would say, the legacy behind that product, too, right? I mean, it, it, it was built solely on George Brown's ideal, you know, at, at, when the fire... The 1910? The, yes. Well, it's interesting, though. So, um... What happened, so backstory here for all of y'all. Yes. Um, 1910, there was a fire on Whiskey Row, one of many fires that have happened on that little strip. But they had a vat of Old Forcer they were about to bottle. Back at that moment, Old Forcer was bottled in bond, right? Yes. So you've got 100 proof Old Forcer sitting in this vat ready to go through a bottling line. Fire happens, everyone's got to get out, it just sits there. They didn't know what to do with it once they get back in the building, they threw it back in a barrel and said, we'll figure it out later. Right. 
years and years later, they dump it out, and they didn't sell it as Old Forester. It was never sold as Old Forester. Right. Very old, fine whiskey, and it went to, like, friends and family and executives and, like, you know, fancy people, and yeah. that's fine. Um, the we, schmucks. No, not I'm that. Just I'm just kidding. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a brand that they were interested in growing. It was just sort of an oopsie, and let's right. gift it out because it yeah. was delicious. Um, so, yeah, there's a genuine story behind it. We followed the exact same production protocol with it. We took 100 proof old forcer, put it in a secondary barrel that's been heavily charred, and then emptied it out later. The proof is just because it tastes good at 93, 100%. Interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, what are your options? You enter that secondary barrel at 100. Right. You really can't put it into a bottle anything higher than really 97 after tax and tip is all included in there. <laughs> um, so it had to be a little bit lower, but 93 was such a sweet spot, and yeah. I'm really glad that... That I have those arguments at work because it really paid off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have to try that again? Well, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, but you notice we went out of order, right? We released oh, yes, 1920 we first and then yes. 1910. And the reason for that is because that first batch of 1910, they did their R&D development study on what it was going to taste right, like. Right. And it was inaccurate. And so it sat in the actual barrels longer than it was supposed to. And it came out and it tasted like... Not good. I don't want to say garbage. It was just, okay. it was like chewing on a coffee table. Like it was incredibly Ooh. overly oaked. We still have those barrels laying around today. <laughs> um, I have samples. If you ever come by OFD, I'll be oh, glad to let you taste to. them. I would love to try that. But because it wasn't up to our quality standards, it was like, well, uh, I guess we're going to wait a while on this one and start from scratch again. And so we just released 1920. And so there you go. Well, I look, 1920 is definitely my favorite out of the whiskey Why? world series. To me, it seems to have the most full-bodied flavor to it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that it's the most complex as well. Um, I'm quite a fan of the the darker tannic notes mm -hmm. uh, on bourbon, as well as some of the not. I, I, I like the marriage between those dark notes and the really light kind of effervescent notes, and I feel like 1920 has that. Okay. And, and I I really enjoy it. I, I, ex I especially like the proof. I mean, 115 okay. proof, I think, is great. You you seem very no, cautious as everyone's, to... I, no, you're saying some of the same stuff that most people say. Everyone's, oh, I love high proof. I love high proof. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> sure. Um, it is delicious, and it's a great proof point. Um, the proof point is actually historically relevant to Old Forcer. That was our barrel okay. strength in 1920. Yeah. That's why it's chosen that. So the blend is made to coincide to make that proof point work right. as opposed to the backwards way that we do the 93 proof for 1910 sure. or the proofing for sure. birthday bourbon. Um, so it's interesting, but it's actually the most minimally filtered old forester on the market so far. And that's all okay. I'm allowed to say. Uh, <laughs> we don't chill filter anything, but that one gets such a really quick light load carbon Period? treatment. We don't chill filter anything. No. Why? Why are that. you so shocked by no, that? No, I didn't know that. Um, I mean, at that high of alcohol concentration, the chill filtration really, I mean, we don't have a chill filtration system anyways, but it's pretty shelf stable the higher up you go. And at 115, it's pretty safe. Wait, wait. Oh, what? Okay, whoa, whoa, hold on. No, no, wait, no. Wait, uh, do we need a backup and explain are, are, chill filtration? So even down to 86 proof. 86 proof is not chill filtered. It's a carbon treatment. How you I vary, had no idea. Really? I honestly did not All know of it, that. Yeah. None of it is chill filtered. That's, first off. Good for you guys. I think that's uh, that that's something that more people in the whiskey industry should kind of try to adhere to. I mean, it's just it, another one of those things that the general consumer is going to start gaining knowledge on. Back yeah. in the day, no one even thought about what the difference of a mash bill was going to do. You know what I mean? That's so true. then they start yeah. learning more and more about the category. Absolutely. We've never chill filtered. It's just not what we do. Okay, well. It takes longer. It's a pain, but we just don't do it. It's fine. Well, now I've learned something more that I didn't think look I was going you. to. Look at you. Yeah, hey, get hey, learned. Look, look the, the podcast is not Aww. just for me. It's for everybody else, but apparently today it is for me. It's a little, a little bit, for you today. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. You can have that. You own that. I'll take that. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I want to talk to a little bit, and, you know, this is a topic that we could get into in the future as well you know with a full like hour and a half to sit down but mm. um this is just a what, taste this, this is a little, just tease. A little, little teaser yeah <laughs> what were the experiences that kind of led you to be able to adopt the moniker of master taster because so, it's not something that you just wake up one morning and you're like hey i have i have a great palate that you know no. everybody can adhere to but, no and honestly i didn't like 
grow up going, one day I'm going to be the master taster. <laughs> like that was never my career path. Um, so where do we begin? Um, Old Forester started growing pretty quickly, yes. right? And they noticed that that growth was coming from the hundred proof and the leader size, and that right. is indicative that it was coming from on-premise bartender yeah. usage. Um, so one day around the table, Old Forester team was having a combo about we need a new face. Marianne had just left Brown Foreman, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Chris Moore's like Woodford is growing like crazy. We bring in Elizabeth; she's doing a killer job. But Chris is only one dude, and we got a lot of brands. So they started. Right. Maybe it's time for Old Forester to have a person. It's got to be a person that can understand both the science side and also this cocktail drive that's happening with the brand. And so I'm sitting on a chemistry degree and a biology degree with the original intention of going to medical school. And maybe we'll explain wow. what happened there <laughs> in our longer <laughs> podcast, since this is just a tease. Yes, we will um, do that. But I bartended my way all the way through. I moved to okay. Louisville, Kentucky for reasons that, again, we'll talk about <laughs> in our longer <laughs> podcast. Um, and got a job with a really great hospitality group here that had a really great bourbon bar. And I just fell in love with the category. One of my bosses was the master psalm. He taught me so much. That's great. And honestly, it's just one of those things. Like, I don't know. Like I've always had a really sensitive palate. I wouldn't say that I'm a picky eater. But I would say that I have a, a palate of a five-year-old, for sure. Like... <laughs> It's, it gets overwhelmed very easily. Hot dogs and mac and cheese. Hell yeah. <laughs> Chicken nuggets for days. Um, no, seriously, that sounds really good. No, right? no I, I'm, no, I'm really. actually like, really no, I'm like, hungry now. There's mac and cheese yeah. like booth over there. Is we there should, seriously? Yeah, but then they got all the weird stuff like truffle stuff. and goat what? stuff in it and oh. whatever. I don't know. Like... I need basic. Jackie, you're talking a language right Okay, now. so anyways, so. back to the story. <laughs> master taster. So I get hired on with Old Forester to be a master bourbon specialist. Yes. It's a hybridization between a master mixologist, which I don't believe in the word mixologist because it's pretentious and it's awful. Um, that and a master taster grooming role, right? And so I told Campbell within my first couple of weeks, the day that new distillery opens, I will be the master taster for this brand. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> all right. So then I started my production training, my sensory training, my R&D training, all of that, and was just immersed in it. Yeah. You go through all the training. Because everyone thinks that it's this, like, you sit around and wax poetic about, like, oh, I'm getting almonds and, you know, oranges and blah, blah. That's not it. <laughs> it's, okay, um, <laughs> did anyone else happen to notice that you scorched the corn on that? Did anyone else happen to notice that there was must on that? You know, it's more right. defect-driven. It's not tasting note-driven. Because um, it's a quality control situation. Absolutely, yeah. I oh, hate yeah. tasting notes. I hate tasting notes. Have you ever done a tasting with me for a single barrel? I don't say anything the whole time <laughs> because I don't want to plant the seeds. If I tell you, like, oh, I'm getting roses, you're going to go, yeah, I, I give roses. I'm not going to ruin that experience for you. Like, I want you to sit there and smell it and go, no, this reminds me of, give it a second, oh, my great aunt Opal used to make these cookies and like, it takes you to that place. Yeah. And that's what's so awesome about whiskey is there's an emotional connection. There's that yeah. sensory connection. Absolutely. You need to have that. I don't want to rob you of that. I hate tasting notes. <laughs> I do. I really do. I get it for the purposes of like... I would love to introduce you to Fred Minnick. Who is the tasting? I know. <laughs> he and I butt heads on it. He sits there and he just like, brrr, like starts rambling, mm -hmm. and I'm just looking at him like, Shh, shut up, dude. Stop no, no, talking. You're ruining it for everybody. <laughs> it's necessary. You know, general consumers like, I like this. Help me find that. Right. You read the little hang tag. Yeah. On the bottle, blah, 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 blah. I get it. Personally, I don't like tasting notes. Which is really, really interesting from a master taster. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Well, is it? it? It sounds like it is. Probably the only master taster that'll actually admit that. <laughs> that but, they don't like tasting know, notes. That's yeah. fine. Well, no. we'll get into it more yeah, we will. In, the, in the future podcast. But you all I should know. definitely go check out Jackie's I Can at Old Forester because A, she's awesome. B, Old Forester has great whiskey. I'm usually there on so. Tuesdays if you stop by the okay. distillery. Tuesdays. That's my day. Well, that's unfortunate that uh, this uh, is coming out on a Wednesday. So everybody has to wait six whole days. That's okay. Wednesday. They will. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, so much. Thank you. Absolutely. And with another bourbon and beyond in the books just want to say thank you again to everybody for allowing me to be a part of this and, and giving me the the platform to have these conversations with these fantastic uh bourbon and uh culinary folks just a really truly fantastic experience this year and 
can't wait for next year. I think it's just going to be even bigger and better like it was this year. So to wrap things up, I'm going to let you know where you can find us on all social media channels. And that is at my bourbon pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you could please give us a five-star rate and review on iTunes, that would be superb. That is a great way for people to find us and to, you know, really kind of promote the show a little bit. Uh, you guys are just as much of a part of the show as I am or Curtis or Swan are. And, you know, the, the more that you put into it, the more that we can kind of uh, get out of it. And we really do appreciate all the help that you guys have given us so far. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to thisismybourbonshop at gmail.com. We'd love to read some stuff out uh, from listeners of the show answering questions or, you know, addressing some comments if they have them. And I think we're going to try to start doing that soon if we uh, get some get some of those in. If you're not yet a part of our Facebook group, you can head to facebook.com and search for This Is My Bourbon Group. Just a couple of questions for you to answer so that we can verify that you are who you say you are. And then you can become a part of a really fun little community that has been kind of growing very steadily. And uh, we have a good time talking about bourbon, uh, stuff that's in the news, and all sorts of things that are going on with the show. And then last but not least, patreon.com slash mybourbonpodcast is where you can become a supporter of the show for as little as a dollar a month. That really, really does help us out, y'all. It, it just means the world to us that, you know, you want to support us in any way, shape, or form. It's just for, you know, you can start at a dollar uh, and it goes all the way up from there. You can check out some of the tiers uh, that are up there. You get things like bonus episodes. You get live chats. Uh, you get to hang out with us uh, in, our, in our little group that we have as well. Uh, there's just a lot of fun stuff that happens over on Patreon. So again, patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast. Would love to have you over there. No pressure as always, but we do appreciate it. That about does it for me on this week's episode and for another year of bourbon and beyond cannot wait for next year thank you all so much for listening it's been a real pleasure getting to go on this journey with you i'll see you next week but until then i'm perry and this is my bourbon podcast bourbon.